If I shouldn't wake her, there seemed no reason I shouldn't try to communicate. Arlene, can you hear me? Quiet, she said. I don't want Fly to hear you. He's depending on me. Why don't you want him to know about me? I asked. Because you're evil, she said with conviction. You're all evil, you bastards. She walked slowly down the corridor. So long as she wasn't in danger of hurting herself, I saw no reason to shock her out of it. Why are we bad? You scare me. You make my brother do bad things. Up to that point, I did not know that Arlene even had a brother. It was weird. I thought we'd known everything about each other's family life. She talked about her parents and growing up in Los Angeles all the time. I was uncomfortable pursuing the matter, but I rationalized away my moral qualms and decided to play out the hand. Who are we? I asked again. She swayed, drunkenly, delivering a monologue like those weird, old plays from previous centuries. Bad things are in the air, in the night, making my brother crazy. He'd never do bad things except for you. I thought I'd never see you again. Why'd you follow me into space, to Mars, to Deimos? When I grew up, I thought you weren't real, but now I know better. You followed me, but I won't let you get inside me, not inside. When Arlene had kidded me about going down memory lane, I took it in good humor. But if we were going to have to relive all the bad stuff from our childhood as the air leaked away, I was good and ready to say goodbye to Demos now, rocket or no rocket, instead of later. In the meantime, what was I going to do about Arlene? I couldn't let her wander the corridors arguing with ghosts from her childhood. With time short, and no way to send to Earth for a correspondence course in psychology, I went with common sense. Arlene, we'll make a deal with you, I said. We'll stop bothering you, and let you get back to fly. In exchange for what? She wanted to know, quite reasonably. Because we've moved back to Earth, and you can't touch us there. Fly and I are building a ship to take us to Earth. Ha! We don't believe you two will get anywhere near us. You'll be stuck on Deimos forever. That's a lie! She snapped and stopped walking. We'll fight you again. She stared right at me. We're not afraid of your little genetic stupid men. Big words, I said. She came right at me, fists raised and started hitting me. As I fended off her blows, not too difficult considering the difference and reach, I yelled, Hang on, Arlene! I'm coming to help you! This is Fly! Fly! As I say, I never took any courses in psychology, but I acted in school plays. And to steal a phrase, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to go with the flow. I gave myself a magna cum laude graduation as her eyes came into focus and she recognized me. Fly, what happened? We've been fighting monsters again. She looked around the empty corridor and then back to me. I didn't have to spell it out. How much longer can we take this? Not a second longer than we have to. Arlene started seeing weird colors after that. Auras, shadows, and things she wouldn't tell at first. Sometimes she would put the tech documents down, sitting quietly with her eyes shut until the colors went away. It scared me plenty, but it terrified her. She was losing her mind, and she knew it. So when I told her the engine was 80% finish, Arlene urged, Fly, forget the other 20%. It's done. Let's blow this popcorn stand. I had to be honest. A.S. There are still a few systems I don't think are in really good shape. We can't wait. We've taken chances with worse odds than that the whole time we've been on this rock. Fly, I... I stopped being able to see color vision this morning. All I can see is gray, except when I hallucinate a rainbow-colored aura. 
and my peripheral vision is shot. She paused, licking her lips. And Fly, there's something else. She came close and spoke softly, seriously. I want to confess something to you, Fly. What would your nuns think of that? For the first time, I'm really afraid. I'm afraid I might kill you, thinking you're one of the monsters. I couldn't stand that. The little voice in the back of my head had whispered that possibility when she first imagined the pumpkin. It was a chance I was willing to take. Even so, I was glad she, not I, stated the danger loud and clear. I sped up preparations, insisting that Arlene sleep whenever possible. The air and pressure problems were getting to me as well, but I handled them better than Arlene. Of course, the problem with oxygen starvation is that you are not the best judge of your own reason, but the best chance for both of us was to finish the rocket, and we were close, tantalizingly close. I suddenly got the creepy crawlies. I recognized the symptom. I was picking up the same psychosis as Arlene. All right, I acquiesced. We go in the next few hours. We have a chance, I guess. 80% is 80 points better than zero. We got busy. We drank water. We ate a last good meal of biscuits, cheese, fruit, nuts. The Eskimos say that food is sleep, by which I guess they mean if your body can't get one kind of recharge, you might as well take the other. Arlene abandoned me to work out the telemetry program that would, God willing, launch us, kill Demo's orbital velocity, dropping us into the atmosphere, and then take us down, at which point she'd hand over control to me to find a suitable spot to touch down. Fortunately, it was basically cut and paste. I doubt she could have written it from scratch, not in the condition she was in. The hand of God must have graced her, though she'd never admit it for her to keep it together long enough to patch it together. As we prepared to leave, I kept running the basic worries through my mind. The mail tubes were designed for Mars, which has only a fraction the atmosphere of Earth and a much lower gravity. The specific impulse developed by the rockets might not be enough to overcome Earth's gravity as we spilled velocity and tried to land. On the other hand, the thick atmosphere might cause so much friction that our little ship would burn up. The launcher was a superconducting railgun. Reminded me of the Eight Loop Wonder at the amusement park back in the Midwest. This time, I hoped I wouldn't throw up. At least this piece of equipment didn't have an auxiliary chain. So, what was there to worry about? I grunted the launcher around a point opposite Demo's orbital path. The rocket controls were simple to operate thank God. Throttle, stick, various navigational gear that I didn't really understand, and environmental controls, all ranged around my face in a tremendously uncomfortable position. Then suddenly, a few hours before our scheduled departure, Arlene totally freaked out. At first, I thought she was joking. She strolled up to me and said, Don't try to fool me. I know what you really are. Yeah. A prize son of a bitch, I said distractedly. A moment later, I was on my butt with Arlene's boot on my chest and a shiv, a sharpened piece of metal, against my throat. Looking into her eyes, I saw the blank look of a zombie. And for a moment, Jesus, I thought they'd somehow gotten her, reworked her. But it was just the low pressure, or maybe slow oxygen deprivation. I talked to her for five minutes from my supine position, saying anything, God knows what, anything to snap her back to some semblance of herself. After a while, she dropped the shiv and started crying, saying she had murdered God or some such silly nonsense. I wasn't going to abandon her, no matter what, but there was nothing in my personal rule book that said I had to make it any more difficult. We had med kits in the shed. I gave her a shot. She struggled, coughed, and turned to me. Why can't we eat our brothers? She asked. Then the drug took effect. She'd be okay, 
in the mail tube rocket. We've more pressure, and more important, more partial pressure of O2. She'd be all right, I hoped. I put her aboard the rocket, threw in a bag of supplies, and squeezed in next to her. It was like being in a sleeping bag together, or a coffin. I positioned myself so I could reach all the controls, took a deep breath and got serious. Just before lighting the cigar, I remembered the stark terror of riding in the E-7 seat of an S-8 Subhunter snark jet and coming in for my virgin landing on an aircraft carrier. Trusting entirely to the guy on the other end made me more nervous than the idea of landing on a postage stamp. Well, this time, for better or worse, I was the guy with the stick. Considering that I'd never flown anything but a troop shimmy over some mountains, I almost wished I were back in the S-8. I threw the switches, pushed forward on the throttle, oddly similar to a passenger airliner, and the rocket slid along the tube, launching at 10 Gs. Arlene was already passed out, of course, and she missed the pleasure of blacking out with me. Suddenly, I discovered myself in a strange room, a faint hissing catching my attention. Black and white, no color. I knew I should know where I was, but all these things, this equipment around me was. I should know my name too, I guessed. Then the sound cut back in. Fly? Someone said. A command? Fly. 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 It was me, my lips, saying the word fly. The name. Fly. Me. My name. Then I saw color and recognized the jerry-rigged blinking lights and liquid crystal displays of the mail tube. I'd installed them myself. The mail doesn't need to see where it's going. But we did. Through the slit of a view screen, I saw a deepest blue with faint cotton candy wisps, strings flashing past. I glanced at the altimeter. Much too high for clouds. Ionized gases? Then something socked me in the face, like a 10 millimeter shell, and agony exploded across my face. At first it was bilateral, then it focused right behind my eyeballs, like God's own worst migraine. For a few seconds I thought my head was literally going to detonate. Then it faded, as the blood finally repressurized my cranial arteries and rebooted my brain. I looked at the chronometer. The entire blackout had lasted only 45 seconds. It could have been 45 years. A low groan announced Arlene's return to consciousness. Fly, she moaned. Good luck. I was too busy to say anything, but it was good having her back again. The calculations she'd already worked out for our glide path were okay, and I used the retros to get us on her highway. As we came in, the ride got bumpier and rougher. The interior of the little craft started heating up. Being so close together made us sweat all the faster. When it got over 50 degrees centigrade, beads of perspiration poured into my eyes, interfering with vision. But the temp continued to rise. The mail tubes are supposed to be insulated, but the skin on this one was built for Mars. In Earth atmosphere, we were being baked. The temp boiled up past 70 degrees, and I was gasping for air, every breath searing my lungs. My skin turned red, and I could barely hold the controls. Another minute, and we would be dead. 